Okay, I think we will start now. Welcome everyone to the Public Knowledge Project Annual General Meeting 2024. My name is Marco Tolnay. I'm the chair of the advisory committee. I'm happy to see all of you joining us for our annual meeting. And as a global community, we always come together from many different territories. And today we've asked Marisa Tut to uh, start with the land acknowledgement. Marisa, please. Thank you and welcome. Uh, as Marco mentioned, my name is Marissa and I'm the Associate Director of Publishing Services at the Public Knowledge Project, or PKP as we call it. Um, and as many of you know, and I'm maybe aware that PKP has an institutional home uh, with Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. So in Canada, we have a practice in many of our cities and provinces, and especially on academic campuses, where when we begin a gathering or event, including online events, uh, we begin with a territorial uh, land acknowledgement. So you'll see um, on the screen here that we have a statement that reads, we respectfully acknowledge that SFU, Simon Fraser University, occupies the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And if you can see um, behind me on my little graphic, my image, these are the lands that you'll see behind me on my screen. Uh, these statements are meant to show respect to the lands and its traditional peoples as part of Canada's reconciliation efforts to combat the systemic erasure of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit history. So a land acknowledgement serves as a reminder of the long road towards reconciliation, uh, but it can also be a symbol of appreciation for those the stewards of the lands um, that came before us. And so these statements can be awkward, they can be often political, as they should be, because they reference complex historical dealings and events. And I've got a quick quote here that's been cited on a website native-land.ca just to help contextualize um, the, the meaning and the purpose behind these statements. And it reads as follows. If we think of territorial acknowledgements as sites of potential disruption, they can be transformative acts that to some extent undo indigenous erasure. I believe this is true as long as these acknowledgements uh, discomfort both those speaking and hearing the words. The fact of indigenous presence should force non-indigenous peoples to confront their own place on those lands. Uh, it's by Chelsea Vowell, who's from the Métis um, Nation, and it was cited in Beyond Territorial Acknowledgements. So with that said, we are a global and remote team. And so I'd like to invite you, should you wish to participate, um, to acknowledge in the chat the land on which you join us from today. Um, I encourage you to learn more and consider what it means to acknowledge the history and legacy of colonialism wherever you are joining us from. I'll start off in the chat. I'll share where I'm coming from today. And thank you for joining us and welcome. Thank you, Marisa. Um, so we will have, um, people won't have the opportunity to, to use the chat actually, but we have the, the Q&A section in Zoom that okay. can also be used to, to um, share these things and we might think of a way to, to make that accessible. Um, I will now continue with um, my report. 2023 has been the year we celebrated 25 years of PKP. 25 years of open access leadership, of building a community of tens of thousands of journals and editors of continuous development and improvement of the software, which has established itself as the most frequently installed journal management software and so much more, for instance, in terms of advocacy and research and by operating publishing services that Marie such as mentioned. PKP's advisory committee provides guidance to PKP on all important tasks and strategy we build on the, the rich experience of our committee members uh, who generally come from development partners and contribute their personal, organizational, and national perspectives to the discussions. In the advisory committee, we have discussed matters of strategic relevance for PKP. We have discussed PKP's equity and inclusion work, an approach that has increasingly come under attack in many parts of the world and also an approach that underlines PKP's commitment to equity in publishing and beyond. We have discussed the development of PKP publishing services, which is an important and integral part of PKP's work. And most recently, we started discussing the global push for diamond open access, the different strategies and roadmaps and how they might impact PKP as an established driving force for non-commercial open access. 
I think that the increasing emphasis on diamond open access will benefit our community. We will see more journals, we will see better journals and expansion of the diamond open access scope to books and increasing interest in general in our work. And it is also important to acknowledge that much of this development would not, not have been possible without PKP, especially without OJS. The important role that PKP plays underlines why it is so important to also look at another trend, an increasing interest in sustaining open infrastructure, a topic that we will discuss also later today. PKP is, is well positioned to maintain a leading role in the open access landscape. This is in large part thanks to the people who make PKP possible, a dedicated team and a contributing and innovative community. And all of your work is much appreciated. We will hear about some of the highlights of PKP's work today. Other important aspects of the past year can be found in the annual report that uh, you have seen linked to in the invite to this meeting. I would now like to share today's agenda with you. We will hear from Kevin Stranek, PKP Director of Operations, who will give us a financial report. Uh, after Kevin, Devika Gohl, will, the PKP UX UI designer, will present the user interface and the, the, the user interface design process and the current discussions and future plans. This will be followed by a presentation about PKP won't be bought or sold by Alejandra Casas, uh, the PKP communications coordinator and from Miorace, PKP communications specialist. And after these presentations, we will still have some time left for your comments and questions. I encourage you to add your questions to the Q&A list during the presentations in order for us to always have an up-to-date overview. I think with that, we are ready to go. And I now hand over to Kevin Stranek for the financial report. All right. Thanks, Marco. Thanks very much for that introduction. And thanks, everybody, for joining us here today. So nice to see all of the people here um, and know um, how supportive you are of the project um, in particular, but in the kinds of goals that we all have collectively for a better future for scholarly communication and publishing. So I wanted to take this um, opportunity just to quickly look at some numbers in the financial report, just give you a sense of um, the financial health of PKP um, by just digging into this a little bit uh, briefly. Um, you can see on the, the screen in front of you, um, our revenue, our expenses, and then some sort of gross numbers that are listed there. One of the things that we endeavor to do at PKP is to have uh, sort of the diversified revenue stream to ensure our ongoing financial sustainability. Um, you can see them listed there um, on the left. Um, our largest source of revenue are our publishing services. Marco mentioned those briefly earlier. That's the, the paid service that we provide to folks who want to use our free and open source software, but might not have the the technical means, the server infrastructure to run it themselves. Um, and PKP offers this service for them to, for a fee, be able to receive that from us, um, get our technical expertise and our support. And we're very grateful to all of the clients that we work with around the world, but to our team on the publishing services unit who bring in so much of that, that revenue that all goes back in to fund the project itself for the benefit of everybody. And that's at about, you know, almost 1.6 million um, last year. Um, really grateful for that revenue. Um, next up is grants. And um, the grants are another really important part of um, the financial sustainability of, of PKP. Um, we've been very fortunate to enter into a Canadian partnership with the University of Montreal, the ARD program to form Coalition Publica. And as a partnership, um, we've received generous funding from the Canadian um, federal government through the uh, uh, through the federal funding agencies there that sort of recognize PKP and ARD together as core open infrastructure in Canada and globally. And again, that brings in very um, very healthy grant funding. There, we also received support from Orchid um, in the previous fiscal year, um, and that was very well received through their, it's the Global Partnership Grant at ORCID, and we really thank them for that. The other part of our revenue is our memberships. Many people here on the call 
our uh, institutional members of PKP, and we really um, appreciate that financial support and um, our development partners, of course, who also provide that financial support as well as um, lots of in-kind support for moving the project forward. And this um, really, I think, reflects how much of a community-based open source project we are, um, where we really encourage people to, to sign on as members, to feel an ownership as part as, of PKP, to participate in our governance, um, to participate in our various committees and help set the direction for moving forward. Um, so we thank all of the members and development partners for that. And of course, our home institution of Simon Fraser University that um, provides the, the foundation for us to operate in, provides us with all of the kinds of organizational HR support, finance support, legal support, all of those things um, that they lift us up with. And we appreciate that. And we've also received some um, sponsorships for some events in the past year. And we, we appreciate everybody um, who provides those as well. So as you can see, overall, um, the revenues for last year were um, about three and a third million, um, which is just fantastic to see. And we've seen a steady growth in um, our revenue over the years, um, which has been great as we see the growth of PKP applications um, over time. And this allows us to sustain the ongoing um, improvements and development and innovations in our software, but also to um, continue to provide the kinds of free support that we offer through all of our documentation, online courses, support forum. So all of the money goes into that. You can see um, in the next pie, our expenses um, are all there. And you see overwhelmingly, those are personnel expenses. PKP is all about the people, um, our software developer, developers, our support community, our publishing services community, all of the people who make PKP happen. There's a bit in there for some administration, um, for outreach and community support. That's reflected in things like the sprints um, that we try to hold twice a year and bring people together on that sort of underwrites those. And then infrastructure, um, our various servers and different um, um, organizational software that we use to help run our operations. So by and large, it's people looking at just over 3 million last year gave us a little bit of a surplus, which is nice to see. And that goes back into our, our total reserve funds that are currently sitting at about 1.7 million. Again, something we tried to build up to to ensure a little bit of um, stability, um, confidence that if there's some ups or downs in those various uh, revenue streams, um, we can weather those. Um, so it's been important to us to try to build up a little bit of a re, uh, reserve fund there. But with the surplus that we did um, manage to see in the last fiscal year, we felt confident to move ahead and bring on some um, new staff. Um, we'll have some new developers joining us um, very shortly, but we're very excited about who will put all of their time into um, ensuring that all of our software applications continue to get better to the benefit of everybody um, here in the meeting, but uh, around the world who makes use of the software. So that's really the, the highlight, the big picture. It gives you a sense of where we're at. Um, and Marco, I think we did we say we can take questions in the Q&A now rather than saving them all to the end? What do you think? Thank you. So, this is your chance to ask everything you ever wanted to know about the PKP budget. <laughs> so we don't see any questions yet. We will still have some time in the end of this meeting if you think of any uh, questions in the meantime. But other than that, I think, Kevin, we can move on? Yep, can move okay. on. Thanks for that. Thank you. Okay, we will now continue with Devika's presentation. Devika, can you please share your slides? Oh, yeah. Sure. I'm just going to share my screen. Let me know if you can see my presentation. We can. 
Okay, I might have to share it again. The great glitch of... Um, Alejandra, could you share the presentation? I think it's glitching on my system. I'm so sorry. Okay. Hey, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. I'm diving into all the cool stuff we've been up to in the UX UI realm of our software and the byproducts that came out of all those efforts. For that, um, a brief introduction about me, and that's an accurate representation of my concentration face and not my grumpy face, I promise. But I'm Devika Goal, and I have worked for over two years with PKP as a UX UI designer. I focus on enhancing our software's experience, accessibility, sustainability, and inclusivity through design and user research, UX UI usability testing, and strategic analysis. I'm actively working towards PKP's mission of creating an environment that welcomes users of all backgrounds, ages, and abilities. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, Ever wondered how all that technical mumbo jumbo I just vomited translates into real life action? Well, let me take you on a quick tour through a day in a UX UI designer's shoes. So as a designer, I work, uh, who is a part of the development team and such a big community, I'm constantly in conversation whether it's with our PKP teams, partners, or community members. Why? Because it helps us thrive on understanding our community's needs, pain points, and aspirations. It's like being a detective gathering clues or just standing in front of the store buying candy. Once we, the development team, have gotten a handle on what everyone wants, it's time for us to put those insights into action. We shape these requests into clear specifications and then work with our partners to prioritize these gems into our development cycle and get the ball rolling. Next up, we research, design, and document, which means that I dive into the fascinating world of user research. But here's the twist. I'm not just studying our users around the world their abilities and languages, I'm delving deep into the human mental models to craft an interface that feels like second nature. It's like peeking into the inner workings of the mind to unlock the secrets of seamless interactions. Armed with all the specifications we've gathered from our partners, it's time to put pen to paper or rather cursor to screen and I start designing. But it's just not about throwing together pretty pixels. We as a team are balancing the specs we received with the best UX, UI, and software development practices for a software like ours, accessibility guidelines, and real user feedback from our users around the world. Think of it as a delicate dance between creativity and practicality. And here's the secret sauce we document every single decision we make. Not only does it help us keep track of our thought process, but it also ensures that everyone is on the same page. Next up, we test, collect, feedback, and improvise. Once my designs are polished, and I take them for a spin to our developers view and to understand what's feasible, accessible, and what's not. But that's not all. We make any final tweaks uh, I take my designs on a tour of our partners and community for some good old fashioned feedback. Alejandra, could you move to the next slide? Yeah. Thank you. Um, and armed with all the invaluable input, I dive back into the design trenches and sometimes I might even take a little detour along the way, exploring new ideas or fine tuning my approach. But in the end, it's all about crafting the perfect solution. Finally, it's time to un a new workflow. Armed with all the revised designs and documentations, we usually present the solution on GitHub and Figma. And I promise it doesn't entail anyone crying to get all those GitHub issues approved and merged. The steps I described can be easily integrated into your 
our teams to embrace design thinking and drive success, which brings me to the point. So what did two years of active UX UI efforts achieve for us? First, in the past, we used to jump right into development after collecting specifications, leaving developers to handle the selection and repurposing of UI components. But now with the introduction of design interjection, that burden has been lifted. New systems have been implemented to ensure predictability and scalability. Furthermore, instead of waiting until after we release to collect feedback, we now conduct user testing and accessibility checks upfront. This proactive approach reduces the need for correcting features and solving issues in the next cycle. Initially, we conducted usability tests on design mockups before technical and accessibility assessments. However, as we progressed, we realized it's crucial to perform these assessments first. This approach ensures we present users with well-informed options, knowing the best development path forward. Next slide. Um, which is around the new design system. So Yada and I col collaborated to streamline and unify all UI elements from the redesign of submissions list, translating them into storybook for developers. On the left, you'll see the colors and their various states in our UX, UI, and softwares. On the, and on the right, the translations into the storybook for developers and partners to easily use. For this, Yada and I conducted extensive research into color palette and selected an intuitive naming system to make it easier for developers to use. On the next slide, you can see another example where Yada and I analyze how buttons affect user mental models and establish guidelines for their use to emphasize the right actions. This made our button usage more intentional and user-focused rather than arbitrary. On the right, you can see Yarda's brilliant work in translating these guidelines into the storybook for developers. With this new design system and storybook, Yarda and I aim to create patterns that are both accessible, intentional for the end users and developers alike. On the next slide, you can see the prioritization process. To ensure that we are collecting feedback from all PKP teams and aligning our work better, we developed a new prioritization process. After consulting with our community and users, each PKP team submitted feature requests and improvements for the next development cycle, mapping them on various metrics. We then prioritized and discussed these issues as a team before including them in the development cycle, enhancing transparency and collaboration across the board. On the next slide, you can see the submissions list. So we're currently revamping our submissions list, making them more intuitive, scalable across different languages, and to enable them and to enable more actions directly from the dashboard, reducing the number of clicks. I, along with Nate, began by studying the specifications and user feedback, translating these insights into design. Then I conducted a user research last year to further refine these designs before passing it on to Yarda and Vitelli for development. Together, we're addressing edge cases and ensuring they align with both interface and development logic for editors, reviewers, and authors. Next up, you can see the user invitation process. This is just a few snippets from the entire process, but in collaboration with CraftAway, we revamped the entire user flow for inviting users to OGS, ensuring it compiles with GDPR and gives users greater control over their data. We also integrated ORCID into the system more efficiently. Next up, you can see the discussion threads and to-do lists. I promise this is just um, a working prototype and has nothing to do with the final designs. But we explored this topic in great depth during the Minneapolis Sprint and together with the community developed specifications and a user flow to incorporate a task list into the workflow, which will help editors manage their workload more efficiently. I'll continue refining these designs and will seek technical and accessibility feedback from everybody super soon. Next up, you can see the multilingual form fields. Again, these are just prototypes and have uh, and I've been toying with a lot of options. 
but our software spam fields had usability issues and couldn't scale for various languages. I'm currently developing two options. As you can see, there are like two options uh, for form fields to improve information entry, especially for multilingual content, which means, and sadly, that we'll have to say goodbye to the old globe icon. So I've selected around seven to eight workflows in the system, which involve forms, and I'm creating two or three UX UI options in three or four languages. So this will be reviewed for technical and accessibility standards. And once that is done, I'll gather community feedback through a usability testing session, which I will conduct later in the year. So if any of y'all are interested in participating in the usability research, please share an email and I'll add you to the testing group. Next up, you can see the raw multiple affiliation. So Alec, Pujana, Ghazi, and I are developing an intuitive way to integrate ROAR and multiple affiliations into the workflow. And this is also still under development. Um, next up, um, there are some things to look out for because our list of upcoming work is extensive and I can't cover it all, but here are a few highlights that I'm really excited for. Uh, we're re revamping the author file revision workflow and enhancing editor assignment process by showing data around editor workload. We're doing this in collaboration with Ubiquiti. We're also ensuring multilingual data is displayed and filled in the most intuitive way throughout our softwares. And additionally, we're constantly um, researching and striving to make JATS XML more sophisticated throughout our systems. Um, so if you want to stay connected with us, on the next slide, you will see a QR code, uh, which will basically take you to sign up for our development leads webinar. Uh, the next one is up on June 17th at 8 a.m. on Pacific time. And here we talk about all the work um, that we're doing and everything that's upcoming. So that's it from me now. And thank you so much, everyone. I think I'll pass it on to Alejandra next. Thanks, Devika. Um, Mark, I don't know if we're opening the floor to questions for Devika. Oh, I think you're you're muted. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we we can and we should, but there are no questions yet. So thank you, Devika. Um, we might get back to you when we will enter their questions later on but we can now continue with Alejandro and Famil. Perfect, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so, well, hello everyone. Um, I'm Alejandra Casas, I'm Communications Coordinator of PPP. And um, I will talk today with, together with Famira Racy, who is PPP Communications Specialist, about how by design PPP is not for sale. Um, we wanted to take this moment in the light of some um, scholarly publishing environment trends and changes to reassure the community that PKP will always be a public and community-led project and that we are not going to be sold for any reason. And just to uh, make sure that is, this is much more than just speech, um, we wanted to share with you why or what are the reasons behind um, this, this fact? So PKP is not for sale because it is not bought, it's not meant or not, it was not built to be for sale. So there are some things that back up this decision and these are the, our principles, our distributed uh, characteristics, the community involvement and our governance and sustainability structure. So I will begin with explaining our PKP principles. And these are the core values that move along our day-to-day -day work. So everyone who works at PKP, from designers to community to the directors and everyone involved um, are guided by these um, values that are, are at the heart of the project. So of course we have openness, inclusion, innovation, collaboration, and the one that I feel most close to our mission 
the worldwide right to knowledge. So these principles are not only the base of our work, but also are they are the base of our partnerships and of our community, because we always are searching for institutions, organizations, and individuals that share these values and work with us, um, supporting them and respecting them. Now, Famira, if you want to talk about distributed versus centralized. Right, so thank you, Alejandro. The number one point here is that PKP supports software freedom. Uh, software freedom is not centralized. Since the very beginning, the project has always been distributed under a GPL license. And what that means is that there's a guarantee around the freedom to use, study, modify, and distribute our software. And that any work derived from the original software is then subject to the same terms. So this distributed nature also means that PKP's software cannot be closed to others' use and will remain available as a common good on these terms to scholars and the academic uh, community forever. That's that's what we're going for. This license has made it possible for more than 40,000 journals now worldwide to publish in an independent distributed fashion. We don't have control over those independent and small publishers is the point of the PKP software is that the control remains in the purview of the journals and publishers themselves. The distributed nature of PKP's FOSS works against the common publishing model. Uh, this is not a place where one can go to acquire a so-called revenue generating entity. Um, one last thing is that the GPL protects freedom of users and protects the appropriation of developments. So that is any time anyone can access our code, fork it and rebuild it with the resulting work still subject to the GPL. This very point brings me to the community involvement. Uh, this work is so spread out in the communities that the FOSS is in the building blocks and the DNA of open access and independent publishing all around the world. Um, gl the global communities are investing in the long haul. As mentioned by all the other speakers so far, the communities have crucial parts to play in contributing to the long-term life of PKP software as non-commercial and scholar-led. That is, our software is developed and maintained by more than just the staff here at PKP. Thousands of institutions, journals, and people are using and contributing back to the software. And we work with regions, languages, and unique contexts to do the development, testing, uh, work on the improvements, gather the feedback, and do the translations. So one point I forgot to mention on the text of this slide is that more and more organizations and institutions are coming together to invest financially in open open infrastructure like ours for open access and open science. This is this is the movement that's happening in the world, and that's it for me. Off to Alejandra. Thanks, Tamira. So, following with this idea, uh, some people who might not be close to the project that I don't think are the people on the on the meeting today, but maybe uh, people who are just listening to this for the first time uh, might ask, well, how do you sustain yourselves? And this connects with how, um, well, with the report, the financial report that Kevin just uh, talked us through, through. So uh, I will talk a little bit about our sustainability and commercialization, uh, not <laughs> against commercialization structure, sorry. Uh, so, of course, PKP sustainability is community driven, and um, this question might be answered as many questions in PKP with um, community. Community is a key for our sustainability. As Kevin mentioned, of course, we have PKP members, which are um, financial contributors, development contributors, and also in-kind contributors that help sustain this project. Of course, this also ensures that not only our work, and as Famira said, because the project is maintained and sustained 
by not only staff, but also the whole community. Um, even if something ever happened that PKP were forced to stop existing or working, the uh, the software and the project would be free and would be safe because of all of you guys. Um, we also have research grants there, uh, as Kevin explained. Um, PKP is a an research and university led um, project, and we get a lot of our sustainability and a lot of our funding through these research grants. Of course, the second part, and as we saw on the financial report, one of the most important parts of our sustainability is PKP hosting and services, which is also um, community led because it was created from seeing the necessity of the community and having support that for mm, teams or institutions, organizations that could not have the technical requirements or the technical resources to host uh, OJS, OMP or OPS installations by their own. So um, what they do is they come with us and um, PKP provides these services for them. However, we really want to explain here that our PKP clients, and I am quoting them because that's much more of a technical term than a conceptual one, um, are one of our largest contributors. So whenever someone is hiring PKP PS services, what they are doing is contributing to the project as all the income goes straight back into developing the software and sustaining the project. Of course, we also have institutional support in line with community and distributed approaches. And one of the most important things is that now we are part of the Simon Fraser University. So Simon Fraser University has been the institutional home of PKP for more than 20 years now. However, in 2023, we decided to strengthen that relationship by becoming a core facility of the university. Um, as a view is a public university that shares the values of PKP. And this merge has, um, it is much more than just merging logos. You know, uh, this is a, this is, this was a change that safeguards the public and open character of the project by giving us much more strength legally, financially, and administratively. So uh, having this support from SFU really makes it much more difficult, if not impossible, for PKP to be sold. So, well, there you have it. PKP will not be sold. We will always be free, open, forever. Um, and uh, in the line of taking making decisions towards uh, open scholarly infrastructure, uh, I would like to announce that PKP has signed on to the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. Um, they provide governance, sustainability, and insurance criteria for open infrastructure providers to self-assess and um, improve their practices. So if you want to check out PKP self-assessment, you can scan the QR code or go to our website and you will see them there. And that's it for us. That's a very nice picture of our, <laughs> of our team. Thank you, Alejandro and Famira. We have now reached the end of our list of presentations for this year's meeting and Still, we don't have any questions in the Q&A uh, list. If you are still typing or still thinking of questions, this might be a good moment to speed up. But, oh, we have a question. Okay. I... Uh, and this this goes to to you, Alejandra. I think it's a uh, uh, congress on adopting POSI. Can you say something about the challenges doing that, especially in a university setting? Sure, 
of course. Well, the POSI, um, the POSI criteria, oh, sorry, are you still looking at the presentation? Oh, ah, something happened. <laughs> Wait, I'm going to, uh, just not again, share my screen. Okay. I think that's it. So the POSI criteria, as um, you might know, they give us governance, infrastructure, and insurance, um, insurance guidelines towards um, improving how we run and sustain infrastructure, open infrastructure projects. So one of the more most of the things are led to, um, for example, not having a revenue based um, activity, or for example, opening data and infrastructure, um, taking care of privacy and data security uh, for users. So uh, all of this have to be very carefully crafted within the project, but also respecting the, a university's um, in structure and, um, oh, Alec raised the hand. <laughs> so yeah, I think that Alec can help us if you want to say something. Sure, yeah. Um... So one of the things about POSI is that POSI aligns really clearly with the work that we've been doing for a long time, but it's really good to see a set of principles articulated clearly that organizations like PKP can sign on to. So I would say SFU has been generally very supportive of this sort of thing, um, but it wasn't really a challenge for us to, to sign on. Um, there was one interesting tension because the POSI is a set of statements that lead towards uh, you know, the open science principles. And those are kind of an obligation when you sign on to them. Um, and in contrast, the GPL license that our software is released in explicitly enshrines freedoms on the use of the software. And so in some ways, um, signing on to POSI puts a bit of tension between the freedoms that the GPL provides and the obligations that POSI uh, suggests that scholarship should meet. We were able to meet both of those, but in a way it's it's interesting because the freedoms enshrined in the GPL uh, seek to be limited to some extent by POSI. But um, our emphasis on open access and our uh, longstanding commitment to free software made it a pretty easy one for us. Um, it's Again, it's really good for us to see um, this kind of broad statement in support of open scholarship that many organizations can sign on to, uh, and it was easy for us. Kevin, I see your hand raising. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's no, 2024 and I'm still on oh. mute. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Yeah, and I can just give you maybe a sort of a, a concrete example of what this looked like. I think when we went through the, the POSI principles, um, we're getting a sense that a lot of them might have been more directly written towards like a nonprofit or an independent company. And because we're embedded in a university, any of our responses to those questions had to be within the university context. Um, we're very fortunate that SFU is very supportive of what we're doing and SFU is very aligned in our values. So these these generally fit and it wasn't, wasn't an issue. Um, but sometimes some additional explanation was needed. Um, when you talk about governance, of course, PKP has our advisory committee, um, that's so important for guiding us. But ultimately, we have the university's board of governors, who is really, you know, at that highest level, um, our governance structure. So it is a little bit more complex. And also as a university core facility, um, you don't typically run a financial reserve. Um, you know, you spend your budget out every year, and then you get a fresh budget in the new year, and you move on. And if you uh, have unspent money, sometimes it's sort of drawn back in because you didn't need it. Um, so there was um, some challenges with with how that works. Again, fortunately, our university is supportive, understands the unique nature of PKP, and understands that um, 
we need to run that kind of a financial reserve. So it was supportive of us there. So while this has been a useful exercise for us to review these excellent principles, um, to share with you how we meet them or where we're continuing to try to make some improvements or changes, it also facilitated a really good conversation with our university about this is what the community is looking for. This is the kind of project PKP is. Can we align those? And that's gone very well. So it was uh, a very good experience. Thank you. So we had another question in the, the Q&A about the timeline for upcoming UI uh, updates. David has already answered the question in the Q&A section. Do you want to add something uh, in this meeting, David, or maybe uh, show the release plan? Sure. So uh, basically, it's going to be a part of our 3.5, which is supposed to be a long-term um, support release. And if you go on PKP's GitHub projects, I have shared a link. Um, there's a public roadmap where you can see all the upcoming um, uh, work that we've been up to and what's in the pipeline. Um, so yeah. You. So, are there any other questions about today's presentations? Just a question there about Devika's contact information. Um, maybe we could drop that into an answer for everybody. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't see any other questions in Zoom. Um, I think that means that we didn't leave out any information that you needed in today's presentations. And I think we're ready to come to an end. Thank you to all speakers and to everyone involved in, in the work presented today, reflected in the annual report and in so many events uh, that PKP has been offering in the past years. Uh, I think that there will be future, I'm pretty sure <laughs> there will be future opportunities to talk and to learn and to, to get more insight into PKP's work. But for today, this is the end of this meeting. Uh, thank you all for attending. See you soon. And I think congratulations to be a part of this community. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.